Welcome to Breakthrough Spotlight. We're so happy you could join us. My name is Hari Ziad and I'm the content strategist at Breakthrough, a nonprofit organization that uses arts, media, tech, um, and tech rather for culture change. And today I'm joined by Ted Kerr, a founding member of the collective, What Would an HIV Doula Do? And Cayenne Durosho, founder and executive director of Gays and Lesbians Living in a Transgender Society. Two brilliant advocates who have been modeling what it means to care for the most vulnerable members of our communities, especially away from state structures and their often criminalizing responses to public health crises. Um, and we want you all to be a part of the conversation too. So please chime in on social media using the hashtag Breakthrough Spotlight and drop whatever questions you might have in the comments of the broadcast. We'll do our best to answer them at the end of the dialogue. Um, so Ted, I wanted to start with you. Your work at What Would an HIV Doula Do has fundamentally shifted how I and quite a few other people that I know um, engage with public health matters, especially around HIV. But could you start off by explaining your approach? Um, what is a doula for those who don't know? And how do you use this framework within the HIV context? And how might it apply to um, COVID-19? Uh, those are great questions. Thanks, Harry. It's an honor to be here. I just want to just name that I'm on uh, Lenape land, and I'm a cis white HIV negative dude. So I share that so you understand the context that I'm coming from. Um, you know, a lot of people will understand the word doula as um, somebody who helps somebody having a baby. It's a historic term. It goes back to like, um, you know. Uh, well, it seemed like we're having some technical issues with Ted, but we'll return. Oh, Ted, I think. Sorry, sorry. about that. I'm back. So, um, and maybe people also know that in the last like few decades there, we have seen the growth of people who do end of life doula work and abortion doula work and gender doula work. And so um, me and a group of people were wondering, well, what could a doula do when it comes to HIV? And through asking that question, we came to understand that a doula is someone who holds space during times of transition and that HIV is a series of transition that starts long before you might take an HIV test and will exist long after you start medication and maybe maybe even after um, you end this life. And we've been curious about how we can doula ourselves, doula each other, but also doula the systems. An early conversation that we had was with uh, Jessica Danforth from Canada, who does doula work in the Canadian prison situation, and she's often brought in to help um, people who are about to give birth. And what she understood is that while she's there to support the people giving birth, she's really there to do live the system to help them understand that actually you shouldn't have uh, people who are giving birth in handcuffs. So she mm. sees herself as dueling the system. And so in this time, we see ourselves to think about how we can also be dueling the system and ourselves. Mm, I love the, the series of transitions that we're, um, that uh, using that framework, applying it to, um, HIV was something that I'd never, um, thought about before uh, coming across your group, but um, hearing it, it makes perfect sense. And I've, uh, as you mentioned, there's so many other opportunities for us to um, hold space for people while they're in transition. So um, thank you for that. Cayenne, um, I wanna turn to you. You've been maintaining houses for trans folks released from Rikers. Um, why is that so important right now? And how does that fit into the larger mission of your organization? As a founder, when, when COVID had first, we, we, it became our new reality. It, it was a flash thought. It was a, like a brain fart. It was an idea that needed to happen because the obstacles people are going to go through in jail to stay healthy and protected it's ridiculous if you think of how people are criminalized and how they're institutionalized in jail, what would they do in a pandemic? It would kill them. So, you know, this work was an idea just to simply get people out, but it became bigger work when we think of them not going back. Mm. So I had this full idea to get them out, bring them home and give them the tools to live better or want better for themselves. And in that, we can create a new generation of advocates, of 
people going to school, of people getting their needs met so they don't go back to jail. Mm. Recidivism is a really screwed up thing in this country and all over. Right. Um, so, and it's uh, what I'm hearing is that, like, this is a problem outside of COVID. Um, we're talking about, you know, holding space for these folks now, um, but you're also looking to the future. Um, and I'm sure you were, this is um, just building off your work before, but for those of us who don't really know um, Glitz, if this is our first time um, hearing about your work, could you just give us a little more background on what you were doing before this moment? Um, Glitz to gays and lesbians living in a transgender society. Why I started this was I um, simply got a phone call from another country, from Africa, a trans woman saying, please save her. She's going to get killed. And my work started from saving her life. If I could save one life, then I could save other lives. And so it didn't make my work permanently here. It made me global. I was mm. able to get people in this country that really deserve a chance and a chance to live. In, in this young woman's case, the newspapers in Africa said it was okay to kill her. They put her on a hit list with 50 of the delegates in Africa that were queer. She, I think, was, there was only three trans people or two trans people in this 50 people. Most of the people had already been murdered. So she was fighting for her life. And that's what started this work. And I got her to America. She got in school. She graduated. She's a nursing assistant now. She came to America not knowing how to speak English. And now she's driving a car and doing well and living her best life. She went from being a survival sex worker to now a nursing assistant. So there's always hope for a change. And she could still do sex work if she wants to. But the reality is she was able, able to shift that narrative. Yeah, and I think that that kind of leads into my next question, which is that the carceral system isn't really, uh, it kind of precludes hope for change in a lot of ways. Um, like you go to prison because we don't really believe as a state that you could transform or be a better person. Um, and so obviously we're seeing the response to this public health crisis. Um, there's, uh, it's, I, I think it's only natural based on the system that we have that we're seeing a lot more violence um, on the part of the state and policing. Um, there was a report the New York Times did recently that like 35 of the people arrested for social distancing were um, black out of the 40. Um, and so I wanted to just hear you all talk a little bit more about um, criminalizing responses that we're seeing to COVID-19 today. And what does your, your work teach us about the effectiveness of criminalizing communities um, in attempts to, um, to affect the public health of a community? Uh, I can speak really quick um, in a, a piece that I think you had some hand in, Hari, but that Timothy Dwight wrote, he starts with this beautiful sentence, HIV could have saved lives. And the piece goes into beautiful detail about how, how all of these kind of false and shitty kind of ideas of what does it mean to be clean or safe or be at low risk um, helps to criminalize people because as he says, it's you'll never feel clean enough when your blood is considered dirty. I'm paraphrasing Timothy Dwight there. And there's this way in which people living with HIV um, know that criminalization is the world's worst way to deal with a health and social pandemic. It actually reduces testing, it, in, it decreases life chances, it increases stigma. And so we know that the best way to deal with a health inequality is to actually deal with the root causes, which is in this country always racism and misogyny and all those isms. Uh, but to put it in more basic words is, when we're dealing with health, we need care, and prison is the opposite of care. And we know that the people who the state cares about the least are the people who are already marked for premature death. So what would an HIV doula do tries to make sure that we're investing in care 
in the immediate and then a little bit larger. And if, if people are still struggling with like, what does a doula do? A doula stops people from going to prison and a doula does like Cayenne's doing. They work with people to make sure that the transition out of jail um, ensures their best future. Mm, yeah, and we'll get into um, care, what care can look like in this moment a little bit later too. Um, I think that's really important. And Kayan, I did want to hear your perspective on this too. Um, we just very briefly um, referencing a conversation we were having before you started this. And you mentioned about um, why you don't turn to police in certain situations. And so I wanted to hear your thoughts um, of how, uh, wh what your work has showed you about what criminaliz criminalization does um, to the communities that you work with. Um, well, criminalization started with me, and that's why I changed and shifted all my narratives when it came to sex work and survival sex work and advocating and being an activist within this realm, because I was one of those people that were criminalized. Um, and a lot of people know, know this, but the system used the system against me. They put my my address in a newspaper along with an interactive map that put me in harm's way. If that was allowed to be done to me, a Black trans woman that's literally surviving, um, then it could be done to anybody. But you throw a pandemic into this and survival the, all the rates are up right now. What criminalization looks like right now, and people are saying, oh, but crime is down. Rape is up. Domestic violence is up. Mm. What is that for a trans person or a queer community member that is locked into these situations? Our government criminalizes in ways that tears you down. What I want to do is build people up. I did that I police people. I don't police people. What I do is what should have been done for me. I got rules and regulations to what this housing looks like, and that's sustainability. That's actually giving somebody a chance to thrive. If you can't adhere to these little rules about saving your own life, then how can I protect you from the elements of going back to jail? All of our consumers, I don't like to call people inmates at all. All of our consumers are people that are getting out and want to stay out, hopefully. We have to protect them from going back to jail. That's hard to do when you, you're literally letting people out to save their lives, but locking them up again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we just had a girl get out Two weeks ago, she's back in jail. She's back. And the things that put her back in jail, so this is how the system is designed. That's why Glitz is doing its own thing. They put her in a men's shelter, trans woman, on the first. That's an act of violence. Mm -hmm. So she did all the things that you would normally do if you're put in that environment. She got high. She did the necessary things to land her back in jail. This program was not designed to save that girl because she should have never had to go back to jail. So she is getting out again and she, she'll get out this week. And this is a chance for her to get it right. So I'm able to be a mediator in between policing and, and not letting her go back to jail, mm. but just giving her that she can feel better about herself and want to participate in her own care. Right. Yeah. I love that word mediation as opposed to policing. It's a different process that you're doing versus what the state is doing. Even though you're still holding um, people accountable for, for their actions, it's not the same as the violence of the state. Um, Ted, you... Said, you know, we want to donate money directly to the clients. I think that's a recipe for disaster. What you do is you, we, they have a wish list. Get the things they need. Don't give them cash, because what are they going to do? 
I know you give me. I'm getting out of jail. I'm going to get a bag. <laughs> I thought you were really asking us. I was scared to answer. <laughs> <laughs> And that's why, I mean, we can direct folks to supporting organizations like yours, um, which we will be posting a link to your fundraiser towards the end. And I want you to talk a little bit more about what you're raising funds for um, as well, because I think that's important, making sure your money um, is doing what it needs to do to help people out uh, who need that help. Um, I want to pivot a little bit, Ted, although it's all related. You posted a status the other day that really struck me, um, and it kind of got to the same point that you were mentioning earlier. You um, you were talking about considering how this media um, climate is crafting narratives in this moment, and particularly how it is um, deeming who's the hero and who's the villain. Um, so I just wanted you to elaborate on what you meant by that and why is that so critical, especially right now? Yeah, I, I made sure I read it before we talked. Um, it's, the quote was, how will, so uh, let me back up. So what would an HIV doula do um, created a document and it's called 27 questions for writers and journalists considering writing about COVID-19 and HIV uh, because we've noticed that there's a lot of problematic or dumb or some amazing but not enough amazing uh, reporting and writing being done at the intersection of HIV and COVID. And so one of the questions that we posed is, how will your writing position people who are ill or who are placed at risk of illness? How are you resisting the labeling of some people as a problem and others as a hero? Which for me kind of connects to this thing that I was thinking about how we see all of these people like, getting mad and kind of policing each other's um, social distancing or mask wearing. And one thing that I, I was asking people in my community, especially fellow white people is, how is your anger going to be used against other people? How is, your, how is my white rage gonna be used to criminalize black and brown people and trans people and queer people? Because there's a way in which policing ethics is a lot around um, trying to make white middle-class people comfortable and they will use any, the police in the state will use anything to justify in, in ensuring that comfort. And the flip side to this is when we create heroes. So I think the seven o'clock cheering is what it is. It can be beautiful, it can be annoying, whatever. But what it's doing is it's distracting us from the fact that a lot of those heroes are actually kind of held captive due to um, a lack of people who work in that field or because they need the job or because they feel they must. And mm -hmm. it's not making the structural change that the people need. They need more masks. They need better pay. They need safe transportation. They need other support. Our clapping is nice, but I think it's for us. So I think we should be always wondering like, what, what, what scales of balance are being maneuvered and what is being manipulated when we're being crafted ideas of hero and villain? And I'm really upset when I see someone yelling at somebody for not wearing a mask, because we have no reason to know why they are or aren't wearing a mask, for example. Yeah, and um, Kayan, I wanted you to chime in there too, um, especially as you know, um, sex work in particular is so demonized in the media. Um, but in this particular moment, I mean, it's so easy to say, you know, I, I think I've even read statuses and like people shouldn't do blah, blah, blah without taking into account um, the whole story. And so I wanted to just get your your comment on that, too. What what ways are you seeing the media um, shape these narratives and how do we push back on that? The media sucks. Um, <laughs> Straight to the point. Uh, <laughs> um, it's another avenue, and in COVID, what we have seen in organizing is bullies. We've seen tactics that I would not adhere to. We see behavior online because there's a culture now of safety from behind the screen. So mm. you can do say the most ridiculous shit ever. And it's getting in the way of what the realities are is when COVID is over, somebody like me is going to jail. Then mm -hmm. HIV rates are going to skyrocket because people are not able to touch and connect. 
And your criminalization is going to look like coming out of this. It's going to be brown and tan people, black people that go to jail. And it's, it's already happening in COVID. Social media is putting, I've seen the worst stuff ever in my life. In the beginning of this, I literally broke down day after day from just the amount of abuse I was seeing on social media. Abuse to sex workers, abuse of privilege, abuse, a privilege that we don't have. I don't have the privilege of, I do have the privilege of being in a house and isolating because I'm not confined to one room. But I don't have the privilege to go upstate and live comfortably or go to, say, Narragansett and sit on the water and, you know, have a Mai Tai or do any of that where you see people are talking about these things and having that experience throughout COVID. You go to the Bronx and you see a bunch of Black people who don't know how to social distance mm. because they're... they're being projects and shit. How do you social distance in it? And being criminalized. But then you turn around social media, you see cops handing out masks to white people. We, you, that same practice should have been applied uptown other than arresting people. Mm. So we're going to be in this and out of this. But the numbers are going to increase. Everything they're saying is, oh, the crime rate is down. Now, yes. now, people are not going to have jobs. Sex right. workers, right, survived on their own money, now have to rely on resources from somebody that may be an asshole. But they got to go to that asshole for that money because they can't survive. A lot of sex workers are literally going to come out of this homeless. If we don't do anything about this, we're just going to watch them die. We don't know what criminalization is going to look like past this point. Right. That's so, so important. And I think it brings me to my next question, too. Um, if we know that this, the criminalizing response to this moment isn't the answer and more violence and incarceration um, isn't going to improve public health, in the long term, what is the alternative? Um, how do people deal with issues like people who break social distancing measures or um, harm people because they don't know or they, they don't care in that moment? How do we um, hold people accountable? Back to your point about mediation, what does that look like? It's horrible. Um, I, for the first time, left my house two weeks ago to go food shopping. I came home and fell apart. I seen people that didn't care. I seen the worst of humanity. And, and I hadn't seen any of this. I've, I've been isolating. I've been doing the things. And to see not only the streets covered in plastic gloves and masks, but just the, the sad eyes behind these masks and, and also the, the fear, because I definitely had fear. I don't know who the fuck is behind that mask and why are they looking at me? That, that's real. Mm -hmm. So you add a mask on, I can't imagine how, it just messes with my head. I can't imagine what this is gonna look like. I got a feeling we're gonna be wearing masks for a very long time. How many people are gonna be shot when they open up and the excuses they had on the mask. Mm -hmm. And what will those people look like? They'll look like me. They'll look like me. Their pigmentation will be like mine. It, it's, it, it, I've seen the worst of the worst. I've also seen the best. Mm -hmm. I've seen us organize in ways that just make sense. And then there's some organizers that really can kiss my ass. <laughs> but that's only because I am unapologetically Black, and I dare one of these kids to say something about how I organize in peace with Black people, white people, Chinese people. I don't give a damn. Organizing is organizing. And if you can't organize well, you can't do this work. 
Can yeah. I just say that you are a living legend and every time I hear you talk, I learn about 12 things. So just let me say that. Um, <laughs> can I also say that I think it's important that we look at how we treat each other, but something we can't lose sight of is that there are forces on top of us that are influencing how we look at each other. So sometimes I think we can spend too much time about how we're doing that and we forget like, we are acting this way because we are scared, because people are broke, because people don't know the future. And that is because the leadership at the top is terrible. I'm not even gonna talk about the, the national government, but of course it's terrible. And there's mixed messages about how the state government is funding. And of course, like the larger culture is also functioning really crap. It is so disheartening to know that there's a pandemic and to know that Cayenne's doing the work that she's doing and then read some like fluff piece about like what Netflix is offering. Like I know that balance is necessary, but um, something that I think would help a lot of people is to to have a sense that, that, um, that other people are feeling put out as well. And if they're not putting being put out, if they're not scared to let us know why and to share the resources, whether it's spiritual or financial. Um, so that's the structural stuff. The interpersonal stuff, I would say that like, we just need to slow everything down. We need to make that eye contact that Cayenne was talking about and to like, just share that fear for a second. We need to ask questions. That's something that what would an HIV doula do is a really big uh, fan of is asking questions like, why aren't you wearing a mask? Or why do you think you can be so close to me? And, and really having heart to hear the answers because in those answers will be the truth of their experience and a reminder that everybody is doing exactly what they know how to do and that we need each other to do better. That's what a doula understands is that we need each other to do better. Cayenne, I feel like you had something to add to that. I'm just, you know, we're, we're in a place where major decisions are gonna be made and they're, they're fighting for bills and making bills. Um, and, and some of the leadership around these bills, horribly disgusting. Um, and I'm too old, I'm, I'm old, so I just sit back and listen, but I've been watching this build up and build up and build up. I'm New York, born mm -hmm. and raised. I have been walking wild trains for over 35 fucking years in my city. I'm sorry if anybody don't like a potty mouth, I have one. Um, and this is a bill that needs to be passed, but the leadership in the bill needs some refinement. And if you're going to say walking while trans, sweetie, that's every day of my fucking life. And every day of a lot of leaders' lives in New York City, every time they leave their house, they are policed by somebody. They are criminalized by somebody. I'm not saying that this happens on a major level, but it definitely happens for Black people. In the organizing of this, being a Black person that does walk while trans, I think we need to organize what this looks like instead of just fighting for this bill, fight for fair housing, fight for the things that make sense. We as trans people are going to be thrown out on the street. As Black people, we're going to be evicted. Oh, all of this is going to come into play. If we don't organize and, and fight for these bills to save us and find a way to do it collectively, we're going to stand to suffer again because the organizers are not really doing the job. They want to be the face, but they don't want to be the solution to, to a bill like that. You have to have a solution. You have to have a beginning and an end. And there's none here. I don't see it. So um, what does that fight look like? Like for an everyday person who's lis looking, listening to this and they're like, yes, that sounds great. How do they get involved? Um, what do they keep an eye out for different organizations? Um, I mean, you could talk about your organization specifically. How do you get involved in that? Um, but also like what are like everyday practices? Uh, Ted, you mentioned asking questions. Um, what are some other things we can do when we walk outside or when we greet, when we see our neighbors um, or when we go to the store? What can I actually do in my everyday life? I mean, so I don't know what everyone's experience of 
um, shelter in place is, or as the artist Frederick Wells, uh, Weston calls it, shelter in grace. So I don't know what people's version of shelter in grace is. But I do know that if you can use this time to think about every moment and think about how it's different for other people, like consider the stairs that you have to take that are non-negotiable and who or couldn't, who could or couldn't meet you in your home. Think about, uh, you know, I am a white, cis, able-bodied dude who walks down the street and, you know, I can, I'm, that's somewhere in between invisible and safely visible. And so it's up to me to think about what would it mean to be a different gender, to be a different race, to consider other people's experiences and to not be broadcasting all that information, to just be letting that be how I change, how I interact with people, to, to, to make community out of mercy and out of love and out of grace. So that's all kind of some spiritual stuff and maybe your eyes glazed over. Um, in a more kind of concrete thing, what you can do is when you read your Facebook friend, when you read your friend's social media status and they're complaining, find the heart of it. Find the thing that they are saying that is true for them that made them post in the real for the real and ask them about it and think together about what you could do to help solve that. So, so be spiritual, number two, take your friend's complaints real and work with them to kind of think about it. And then number three is I would say like, it was kind of embedded in your question, find any community to be a part of and put yourself out there, be vulnerable in community so you can be part of different solutions. I think accidental narcissism is killing a lot of us and we need to figure out a way to get out of our own heads and with each other. I love that accidental narcissism. <laughs> I'm going to use that. Uh, Kaya, what, what about you? Do you um, have anything to, to add to what can people do right now in this moment? Um, they can help. They can help. They can stop being negative. Um, I'm a social person. The hardest thing in the world it's been for me is to have people, volunteers come to my home and they're smiling and waving right on the other side of the window and I can't go out there. Mm -hmm. I can't. And so we got to give virtual hugs. We got to check in, not check out. We got to call people when they, when they feel like they're being called out. We need to find a way to call them in appropriately. Mm -hmm. To not get on, we, we are losing so many organizers right now because of what you just said, accidental narcissism. Um, it's really happening. And it's happening in the date, it's happening in daytime, in daylight, in real time to all of us. And, and we're losing humanity. We're mm -hmm. losing with the essence, and, it, and I'm saying this from a sex worker advocate, from an old pro to some new pros, um, I've never been in this world of where we're biting and tearing each other down to organize in a pandemic. We need to find a way to be healthy in this. And that healthiness is going to make us come out on the other side connected, not mm. disconnected not hating people, not running around saying, oh, you were violent. Honey, people could call me violent because my mouth is notorious, <laughs> but only in words. People are using their own anger against other people. We got to stop this. We already got enough coming down our pike. We need to find a way to do this that makes sense and organize, talk to your constituents. Right now is when you should be writing a letter to your council people. Queer community don't have community because we have no equity. We need to be talking to our, our governors, our senators about actually getting equity because that will help our community stay out of jail, create, we need to be creating. Right now is a time of creation in isolation. Revamping your old pro. Turn that bitch out. Make her special. So when she comes out, she's out. But 
find a way to do this in a way where we're not criminalizing each other for the for the same common ground. Right. We don't want to go to we don't want to die. Right, right. Um, and what I'm hearing from both of you is is that one, this is difficult. Um, and it's also an individual process. Like everybody is going to find different answers. So doing this whole listing of like, here's exactly what you can do is always gonna be um, limited in its effectiveness. Um, but I'm also curious in, uh, to hear what you two specifically do to get past that. Um, like when you find yourself slipping into access, accidental narcissism, obviously you're not doing it in, on purpose. Or when you find yourself checking out, Cayenne, what practices help you check back in? Um, and we know that like the state is is doing everything in its power to keep us from, you know, being uh, having that grace for each other or to be connected with each other in the ways that we need to be. Um, I don't have all of my neighbors' numbers because. Uh, I mean, one reason is because my landlords wouldn't want us to have all of each other's information because then we can organize around that. So there's awesome. structural impediments. Mm -hmm. And and what do you do to like when you when you decide that yes, I want to be more connected? How do you overcome those things internally, but also the external pressures that are are keeping us disconnected? I don't get a. Um since this first of all before this happened i had um facial feminization so i've been in the house for about a month and then this happened so technically i've been in the house since the beginning of april no the beginning uh, of march i've been in the house um i've had to be on 24 7 I've had to pick up phone calls from sales, from lawyers, from attorneys, even on the weekends. This has not been a time for me to, 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 to be able to come down from it. This usually goes on until the time I go to bed, which is like one or two o'clock in the morning. And I'm up early in the morning talking to lawyers and inmates and trying to figure it out. So no, I don't have downtime. I, I would like to shut down. I would like to have some time off from this. I don't get to be the bad bitch that yells and screams at a politician or any of that, because I got to save lives. And those lives are far more important than arguing about a motherfucking bill. I'm sorry. I have to do this. It is my charge. It is, it is what keeps me grounded, is making sure that people live. So I don't have time to, to worry about, oh, I'm so sad. I have, sweetie, I'm okay isolating in my house. There are so many people not okay out here. I, I think what you're saying is so important and I, I wanna answer your good question, Hari, but I also wanna say that like, what you're drawing attention to is that we do have a crisis around organizing and now is not the time to just like, um, I can't think of a non-ableist way to say this, so feel free to at me. Uh, to blind, <laughs> I don't know, we can't just like blindly follow people. Um, we have to be thinking, what are the stakes? Like, what are they, are they fighting with us? What are they fighting for? Um, there's a beautiful essay that Kenyon Farrow wrote a few years ago called When My Brother Fell, Comma, Again. And he's building off uh, the, a beautiful history of poetry. And it's about like the limits of um, the red ribbon as a form of AIDS activism and how you need to do more than pick up art and literature. You have to pick up your, you have to like think about what's at stake and go forward. And, and in the essay, Kenyon is kind of arguing that too many people get distracted by like the baubles or the, the social media cred or the cushy job. And that we need to recognize that and make a choice to not empower those people to be leaders. We need to think about the people who are in community who are fighting the things we want. Mm -hmm. And Kyan, your I, heart, your heartbreak is is shared. I watched. A, well, actually, I've had a couple of conversations with a couple of leaders that are doing amazing work in New York, and 
one of them is overcapacitated, often they call me and I'm here to talk and, and just guide them through. And they were like, you don't deal with this stuff. And I no, I have to set a boundary. And that mm. boundary, if it's toxic, remove myself from it. I also heard from a very young, I think she's a smart young woman, say before she even knew who I was, and she clearly did not know who the hell I was, <laughs> said, hey, I don't see you nowhere in New York. Because, sweetie, I'm global. I am what you call an international icon because I help people all over the world. The reason why you don't see me here in this city is because I'm doing the work from my home. I don't need to be at your meetings. Why? Because I'm saving lives. I, I don't have time for that. Like my mental capacity, save a life, fuck you. Save a life, fuck you. And I have to do that. To, to protect myself in the work. So a lot of these people I'm helping don't even know me, don't even have a clue who the hell I am. I like that. Mm -hmm. I like it. It gives me the boundary and privacy. Always I, worth I, it. It, it. It's a mess. I'm sorry, y'all, but this is my, probably should put y'all on mute for one second. <laughs> Uh, that's the, that's just to her point that um, the work never stops. And um, Ted, I, I was going to ask. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, like some other, like the one thing I don't want to put out there is that everyone should be busy all the time because actually now is a really important time to not be busy. Now is a really important time to check in with oneself and to 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 not take up airspace or social media space if you don't need to, and to be doing the reflection. I know for me, um, I'm lucky enough to have a bike and I live like five miles from Coney Island. So every day or every second day, I ride my bike to Coney Island and I listen to like the most cheesy inspirational podcasts I can find. And, uh, and then we lost that. <laughs> we lost that again, he hit the button. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh, we're a mess. <laughs> um, and then I guess the last thing I want to say too is like find those Marys online that just speak the truth and to like for me, um, do y'all know? Sorry, there's an alarm. <laughs> <laughs> They're coming for me. Oh my god! I live right next to a hospital. This is every meeting for me. <laughs> Oh my God, I think they're coming to pick me up. I, Kayan, we said don't call the police and you called them on me. <laughs> um, I was just going to say shout out to um, Louis Ortez Fernesca, who if you don't follow Louis on social media, you're missing out on pop music history, um, black movement history, Latinx movement history and HIV history. And Louis brings it all together in a way that just really helps my heart, often quoting um, um, Abdul Ali Muhammad, who is doing some amazing writing as well around the intersection between HIV and community love and COVID. Um, Louis Ortez. Well, I love gospel. I've been gospel. Having Sunday morning retreats in my house like no other. I have a stereo system that can wake up both houses on both sides of me. So they're all Hindu and Muslim, so I get a kick out of playing gospel. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just helps me not carry so much. Mm -hmm. We're carrying a lot. Um, one of the things I like most about you is your relationship with your students. And every time I'm at the new school, I come away feeling held. It's like a giant from the kids and from you. And these are young people that are inspiring. What the hell is everybody calling me for? I am on a panel. We'll call back. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's a relationship with your students where they feel trusting enough to share their vulnerability. We were on a, we did a class together the other day. And the kids, I asked them, what are y'all young adults? I asked them, how are you doing in this? And they were vulnerable and shared. 
These are young people that we should be talking to right now. Because also going to school in, in this is a whole different thing. And mm -hmm. and there's a couple of professors here in New York where I'm I'm finding out how the young adults are doing how they're sheltering in place and what it means to them. And how can we help them? If they're students and they can't, you know, it's one thing to be in school and concentrate. It's another thing to be home, everybody in the home. And mm -hmm. concentration looks different. Mm -hmm. And we got to support our, our own. Um, one of the ladies getting out this week, which totally blew my mind, is coming out of jail with her masters. Congrats to her. Oh, definitely. When this hoe gets to New York, <laughs> she deserves a job. Her masters, she has spent the past 10 years busting her ass in jail with mm -hmm. all the obstacles in her way and got her masters. That deserves a hand clap, a twerk, a spin around a block. That's what I want to see out of my community. I, there are things we can do that are really positive, but if I'm going to feel good, I want, I want more girls to have that. Masters, have, have equity, have, have a home. Mm -hmm. have a, if we had real estate that belonged to us in New York City, we wouldn't have so many people in landlord and tenant court. The, we, we need to start thinking of this if we want to thrive as a community. Right. That's so important. And um, I love that you all both brought it back to the things that you do to center um, because I think, and it goes back to what you were saying about spirituality too. I think what you, what I got from that is that the answer is like, you need some kind of spiritual practice in order to do to have that push that I was asking about. Um, you need to have some way to center and to find calmness and um, even despite all of this. And so, yeah, I'll be thinking more about that as, as I continue discovering meditative practices. Um, we're coming up towards the end of the conversation. I did have two more questions for you all. Um, first, Kayan, I wanted you to just Tell us a little more about um, your fundraising efforts right now, what you're raising money for, um, and how we can support. So we're raising money for people, for the people that got out, for their housing um, and further housing. We would like to be able to house them until they can get on their feet and into the right programming. Because we know, as we all know, real estate in New York, sucks and real estate after you get out of jail sucks so we need to be thinking of where these people go for their next steps so we would like to house them for two more months past covid that's sustainability and link them to all the linkages they that there is in new york city with care like i'm we're willing to calls we're willing to assist them we have volunteers that are each, each person that got out has their own individual volunteer. That's how you do this work. It's not policing. It's making sure their needs are getting met. The mm. other thing we're doing, Free Them All for Public Health, is doing a wish list that, that's raising money as well that goes directly. Whatever they wish for goes directly to the consumer. So if you look up Free Them All for Public Health, you'll see the wish list. That money goes, it answers their wishes if they need jeans, sneakers. If And we're learning, uh, we have some trained men that their needs are different. They need binders and stuff. That gets carried out on a wish list. The, the donations to Blitz itself are going directly into housing. We have four, three, two Airbnbs we're about to get a third. And these are Airbnbs in thriving neighborhoods. They're not in the ghetto. So people are looking at what they're entitled to, looking at what the future looks like for them. So we're building a brand in humans that are coming home. We're not fixing broke people. We're fixing people that just need a fix. Mm. They need 
out and a way out that speaks to living, sustainability, building, not tearing somebody down, build them, build them up to be somebody or move on. They're all somebody. Let's help you amplify that so you can thrive in life and you never have to go back to jail. All jails should be closed right now. Everybody in jail is suffering right now and scared mm -hmm. for them. We need to change this. Amen. Yes, yes. And for those of you watching, if you want to make a donation, you can scan um, the um, code at the bottom of your screen um, to do that. Um, actually, I think, sorry, that's a donation to us. The, um, the link to Glitz is um, what we just had before, and now it's at the bottom of your screen. Um, this URL, and it will also be at the end of the broadcast. Um, please support this amazing organization. Um, as you've heard, this is so necessary right now. So we hope you will do that. Um, and then my last question for both of you all before we go is just what are your hopes, if you have any, um, because I, I think it's also valid to, uh, to, not, to not hold on to fake hope um, and to just feel what you're feeling. But if you do have some hopes for the future of the work that you're doing, uh, what are those right now? What are you seeing right now that's inspiring you about how we're talking about these um, issues? Uh, and where do you see that going? So COVID just um, amplifies what we already know about injustice and inequality. And if that brings more people onto the hard work of making sure that there's equality and that there's economic um, redistribution of wealth, then I'm happy. I'm not um, holding out that this is gonna change the world, but I do know that all the people that I love and cherish are working really hard and doing what they can. And so my hope is that everyone I know and care about, and even if I don't know them, but I care about them are gonna be fine and gonna thrive. Yeah, including you, Cayenne. I, um, I get so emotional when I think about this. Um, I had hope from the beginning. I had hope that I would stop working for non-for-profits that were using me and I would be my own founder. And I had hope for that. I had, people guide me and still are guiding me today. My attorney loves me with all her heart. The people that I'm connected to love me and encourage me to do better. I hope that we will have property and equity in New York City, that we won't just be on the sideline renting from these horrible landlords that abuse us, but we'll have our own. My hope is that we have as much equity and that we build doctors and lawyers and researchers that are us, that look like us, that are us, because then we're doing something. When one of us makes it, then all of us make it if we're doing this right. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I think that is the perfect note to end this on. Um, again, if you want to make a donation to Glitz and the work that Kayan is doing. Um, just follow this URL under the Glitz logo. Um, we'll post it again at the end of the broadcast. Um, thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. Thank you, um, all of the viewers who joined us. You can follow What Would an HIV Doula Do and Glitz on social media. Stay tuned for the next episode in Breakthrough Spotlight series. Next time we'll be talking about disability and access in the time of COVID with Doris Quintanilla of the Melanin Collective and Ola Oyewumi of Project Ascend. And that'll be May 25th. So we hope you all will tune in. Again, thank you so much and uh, have a great you. day. Hari, you did a good job of dueling us. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you so much. If I'm getting married, I'd be coming over there. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs>